All right, so we'll get started. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Julia Salata. I think I know most of you on here. Um, I'm the Senior Manager for Collegiate Women's Initiatives for Wrestling a Girl, and I'm thrilled to welcome you all to our third episode of the Living Legends webinar series presented by Wrestling a Girl. In our past episodes, we've had U.S. National Team Coach Terry Steiner, as well as the Executive Director of the National Wrestling Hall of Fame, Leroy Smith. Uh, today, we're joined by another extremely special guest. I have to say that because he's also my boss, uh, Coach Chris Ayers of Princeton University, who has served as the head wrestling coach there for the past 17 years. Coach Ayers has an incredible list of accomplishments, including leading the Princeton wrestling program to their first Ivy League championship since 1986. That was back in 2020. He's guided two wrestlers, Pat Glory and Quincy Monday, to the finals of the 2022 NCAA tournament, which was a first for that program. He also coached Pat Glory to a national title this past year, back in March, ending Princeton's 72-year period without an NCAA champion. He's coached Princeton's first ever freshman All-American, as well as Princeton's first ever four-time All-American, Matthew Kowadzik. And he's led the program to three consecutive top 20 placements, placements at the NCAA tournaments, um, with their highest finish being 13th, again, that just this past March. He's also implemented a year-long training plan that has allowed Princeton to have seven wrestlers who have reached the NCAA tournament back in 2017, which was a new record for the most ever sent by Princeton. He also coached three All-Americans in 2019 and four All-Americans in 2020, both of which were program record numbers for the number of All-Americans in a single year. As an athlete, Coach Ayers was an EIWA champion back in 1998 and an NCAA All-American in 1999. He also held Lehigh's career win record from 1999 to 2005. But all of that being said, um, I think one of Coach Ayers' greatest talents has been his ability to recruit and retain athletes, which is what we're here to talk about today. During Coach Ayers' 17 years at Princeton, he has had a six-year graduation rate of, of 90, 97%. All of his wrestlers have graduated. And in those 17 years, he has never had a single undergraduate transfer. Uh, so all pretty impressive stuff. Coach Ayers, welcome. Uh, we're really thrilled to have you with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited for the conversation. Good stuff. Uh, so we'll get right into it. Um, first things first, uh, in your 17 years at Princeton, as we mentioned, you have had all of your wrestling student athletes graduate. Obviously, this should be the goal for all collegiate coaches, but it can be incredibly hard to actually make that happen. Yeah. What have you intentionally done in order to make that happen? Uh, it's just my philosophy, I think, um, in relation to how wrestling just impacts life. I think the thing we talk about a lot is being good in one makes you better in the other. You don't have to be compartmentalized. Uh, it's the same character traits uh, that allow you to be great at wrestling or the same character traits that allow you to be great in academics. And it just makes sense to apply them in both areas. Um, you know, for myself, I kind of learned this the hard way in school. Uh, you know, I didn't really apply myself for a long time. And then I realized I was just wasting my own time in, in class where I should be just working as hard as I am in wrestling in school because that's where I am. And so we spend a lot of time talking about that, the, the, the character traits necessary to be good at anything in life. Uh, we actually have a book. It's a higher standard manual. Um, it goes through the, uh, through the character traits necessary to be really good at, at, at anything. And so those traits carry over from wrestling to, um, to academics. And so we talk a lot about that. So our environment isn't just about winning wrestling matches. It's about preparing, um, preparing our student athletes for life. I feel blessed uh, to be, you know, an educator, really. Uh, I learned that from my coach. He was a, a father figure. He was a teacher. Um, his lessons went well beyond, you know, how to finish a sing. Um, and so I think by creating that environment where things, you know, uh, where it's, it's more than just the wrestling, I think that helps the kids recognize, um, you know, that they should be working hard in both areas. I'm also fortunate to be at Princeton. So um, the, as you mentioned, the graduation rate for Princeton overall for six years is 97%. Um, so I think that it's a little bit of both, uh, but at Lehigh too, the graduation rate was pretty good, but we, we also had a very high graduation rate because I, I do believe that the athletes uh, were really student athletes. And I think that was emphasized almost on a daily basis that they're there to wrestle, but they're there to be great act students too. So I think it's sort of the environment you create. And that's what, that's what I think my job is as the head coach. I think about an environment. I want to create an environment where a kid can walk in um, and achieve his goals in wrestling. Uh, even if that means being an Olympic champion, we want to have a, an ability to graduate and actually wrestle in the RTC and be an Olympic champion. Or if they're not going to be chasing that dream, which is very, very few guys, they're chasing their dreams in relation to having a great profession, being a doctor, working on Wall Street, being a lawyer. Um, and those 
those are all things that are really important to me. So it's about creating that environment. And we, we, we do, I, I do think about that a lot. Um, and so I think that's the main things that we do to ensure that our guys graduate. Um, it's just not making it, Hey, this is only the wrestling team. Uh, they can't, they can't separate the two. Um, so I would say that's the primary things that we do there. Good stuff. Yeah, for sure. Um, and real quick, we had a couple more people trickle in. Uh, if you have any yeah. questions for Coach Ayers, down in the bottom, you'll see that Q&A button. Uh, go ahead and throw them in there. We will answer all those Q&A <clears throat> questions at the end, but feel free to throw them in there as things come up so you don't forget about them. Um, we'll keep moving on. Obviously, really good hey, stuff to start hey, off with. Julia, too, if uh, if you want me to, I don't know how long you want the answers to be. So if you want me to explain a little bit more on something, just let me know. Talk as much as you want. <laughs> doing great. We're one question in, you're doing great. So keep it up. Yeah, yeah whatever you think is, is important, definitely, yeah. definitely feel free to share. Yeah, for sure. All that good wisdom. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, moving on. Um, so with all that being said, you know, creating balance for our student athletes, uh, making things go beyond wrestling. What do you typically look for in a crew? Obviously, wrestling talent is part of it, and good academics are important. Obviously, you're at Princeton. Um, but what about a potential student athlete stands out to you that gives you confidence that they're a good fit for your program and that they'll be a valuable contributor to your team on and off the mat? So just speaking to Princeton to begin with, and then maybe I could like distill this out to maybe some other programs that have other um, you know, strengths or differentiating factors. But for us, obviously, the biggest hurdle is getting admitted. Um, so as you know, uh, you know, we just look at the top ranked guys and the guys that the wrestlers that are doing well, uh, nationally, uh, and we get their transcripts. Um, it's a challenge to get in here. Uh, and so that's the first line is making sure that they can, that they can be admitted here. Um, so that's the first thing we're looking for, honestly, is their transcript and to see how, what, what type of student they are, because, you know, we start with a stack of transcripts that's pretty big. Um, and that gets thinned out pretty quickly in relation to how we have to, you know, target our recruits. Beyond that, though, I think you're talking to the intangibles a little bit. Um, what are we looking for? So then it, then the next thing is, is you know, it's it's kind of nice in wrestling. I don't know how others actually do it in terms of, you know, this kid beat that kid. And, and, and so we get we get to see how these kids perform. Um, and it's an individual sport so we can see how they do. And we kind of judge where they are within their weight class or um, and within their grade too, in relation to how good of a wrestler they are. So I think those are the first two real easy things. Then you get to like the getting to know the kid. And I think this is sort of what you're getting at. Um, what we do in our recruiting process is, is and, I, and, I, and I think it's important, um, is we're, we're very transparent. Uh, one of the things that we do to ensure that we get the right kid um, is we tell it like it is, and we have a philosophy um, that that attracts a certain type of kid. And the first thing is toughness. Um, so, just some examples: our schedule, for example. Um, you know, a couple of years back, we wrestled Oklahoma State away on a Friday, and then we came back and wrestled Iowa at home on a Sunday. Um, and, and so, the the the. I guess the story there is like we go after the best talent, the best programs. Um, what I what I tell them is I have to make sure that the athlete knows exactly what it's going to look like at the NCAA tournament if they want to achieve their goals. Um, and if we wrestle a dummy down schedule to ensure that we get some dual meet wins or have a really good record, I think that that, that that's a disservice to the individuals on the team. So I really do tell the kids like, hey, it's hard. Uh, we're going to go wrestle the best best teams in the country, uh, and so we we let them know that right out out of the out of the shoots. This is a this is a tough program, and you're going to have to face some tough teams, and the and the season is very tough. And then we add, oh, and by the way, school is really tough too. Um, and so we don't try to hide those things, um, and and we want a kid, and we really try to we'll weed this out a little bit. We want the kid that wants to be great at both of those things. And so, um, so, so I don't, I wouldn't say we try to scare them away, but we tell them that it's hard. Uh, the interesting thing about this and, and most coaches know this, if you, if you work though, if you work hard, you can be successful. So the kid has to be able to be willing to work hard in both wrestling and, and, and go the extra mile, but also in academics to go the extra mile. And so we lay that out up front. 
And, I, and that's just for my program. I would say for any program, it's sort of like you sort of want to figure out what's your differentiating factor. What's the thing that makes you different? The other thing I think a lot about, I mean, a lot about is what are my direct competitors say about us? Um, and so I try to think what they're saying. Um, and then I try to counter that to the athletes that I'm talking to. Um, and so it's just sorting out the right fit um, and 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 figuring out, is this the niche that the kid wants? Is he the good fit? Does he want the things that we're giving him? Um, or, or is he interested in something else? If he's interested in something else, then it's time to walk away. Beyond that, I would say that's like the next tier down is, is sort of like us telling them what we're about. And if they say, okay, I agree with that. Uh, it's not it's not us telling them what they want to hear. I want to be incredibly clear about that. Like we're super transparent about the process. Um, it's us telling them what we want and what we do. And then they have to make the decision. Do I fit into that, into that mold of what these coaches are telling me that they want? Um, and then sort of the intangibles. I mean, there's been times where it hasn't happened a ton, but there are times where I was like, there was a kid I had to have. <laughs> I just had to get the kid. The main reason was I knew this was the place for him. I knew that the kid was going to be extremely successful here. And, and, and I can't tell you all the things that led to that. I think it's multiple things that I think it's like a kids that can be vocal about what they want. Um, and, and, and you could kind of tell who, what kids are like the real leaders. I think most of the kids we recruit at Princeton, they were the best kid on their team. So they were naturally a captain, but what kind of captain were they? Were they the captain because they won the most matches or were they the captain because they actually led in multiple ways? Um, and so there's been a few guys where it was like, we cannot not get this kid because he's a perfect fit for us. And so I think in the process, that's what we're looking for. There's a lot of discussions about fit in a lot of different ways. And so, um, uh, so those are kind of the things we look for in a recruit. Um, some things turn us off where we walk away. Kid thinks he's, you know, the king of, of, of wrestlers and, and super cocky. And, and literally we just won't talk to him. We just don't, we don't care. Even if he's really good, uh, we, we're just not ready for, for prima donnas. Um, and so, so that's happened before. Um, yeah. And just like, we could just tell that, you know, it wasn't going to be, Oh, the other thing too, is the team is incredibly important to us too. In order to, the, 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 the recruits come on a visit and then our team reports back to us. And so we have to take that information is usually very, very useful after a, you know, 48 hours with an official visit. Um, we definitely like to interview our guys and, and take their input. Um, at times, I mean, most of the time we take it and we use it. Sometimes we're like, well, we got a different vibe on this guy and it was 48 hours and maybe you didn't get a really good sense on him. So we have to get a little bit further with the kid in relation to the team. But those are, those are sort of the things that we look for. Um, and I think they're the primary things. Again, I think we know who we are. Like, I mean, that, that's the most important thing. I think in any recruiting process, we know what we offer. We have a certain philosophy around our wrestling and our training. Um, and that's given to the athlete in a very specific and intentional way. Um, oh, I will say with recruiting too, in the beginning, um, we just try to out organize when so, so just a little background. So when I when I started, we were Owen 37 first two years. We were probably we we're probably one of the work well, we were we were the last place team in the in the in the country, really. And so for me and my staff, we had to figure out ways to sort of even that out where to get kids to want to come. And one of the things was like just being organized in our recruiting process, especially with our presentations. It was funny. I think like we were using like uh, you know, just um uh, just like uh, presentation software. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, PowerPoint or the thing through Google, Google uh, Slides. Uh, we were using that in the beginning and I don't think many other people were. And we were laying out things. A funny thing about uh, also about the pandemic is we were using video meetings. I, before COVID hit that year, we were getting really into the, it was just easy to get in a kid's living room without having to go to the kid's living room. 
And so we were using that and then the pandemic hit and everyone started using it. So I think just, just try to be creative in your recruiting and just making sure that you're getting the right kid for your program. I was going to ask you to expand a little bit more on uh, what you're just talking about, because we have a lot of coaches on right now that are either first time head coaches just taking over a new program or have taken over an existing program and, and kind of feel like they're starting from scratch, um, yeah. just kind of where you were at when you took over Princeton. Obviously, they had a storied history in terms of the number of years that existed, but um, you're, you're never shy about saying it was the worst program in the NCAA. So yeah. um, talk a little bit maybe about how what did you do to, to get your first Matt Kalodzic, to get your first Pat Glory, where you just started kind of to get kids to come there in order to start getting blue chip recruits? And, and what was that process like for you? Yeah. So a couple of things. First of all, you know, we had a, the team in the early years wasn't great. And but those kids, they worked hard. I mean, those kids are connected to the program now. Those are kids that stayed in the program, a lot of them. And they also graduated and Interestingly enough, they're some of our best donors. So we'll probably get into that later, maybe just retention wise, like what, what are the important things to keep kids engaged when you're not like good? <laughs> I guess you could say, I think I'm an expert at that. <laughs> That's probably like if I had to give a, if I had to give a dissertation, it's like keeping Can't people, keeping people <laughs> engaged through turbulent times. Um, um, so, so how did it happen? So those, those things, well, we knew what we had to sell. So it was Princeton, like this was the thing we knew our target. Okay. It's like business stuff, right? So, so we knew our target market. We knew how to differentiate ourselves in relation to, we were the number one school in the country. That's why I took the job was like, I could sell that, you know, I could, I could give, I could go into a kid's living room and be like, Hey, it's Princeton. Uh, you want to take a chance? Um, but, but we were in such a tough spot that that even even though we had that, there was other teams in the Ivy League, you know, the number two or three or four school ranked academically that that had a lot better wrestling programs. Uh, and so so to get to that, we just really had to be tough. I mean, I am so especially for your first year coaches, like get used to no. I, I'm numb. It's so funny. A kid will like say he's not coming. I could tell he's totally nervous about telling me he's going to go someplace else. I, I'm so numb to it. I, I I don't, it doesn't even bother me at all because you no, know, I've been in it so long that it, I'm unfazed. Um, and I'm okay with taking no. If the kid says, no, we're not a good fit. That's fine. Go over there. And I generally say, good luck, you know, have a, you know, good luck and, and do your thing at a somewhere else. Um, but for us, to get, it was one by one. So you know, we had to get the first nationally ranked kid, which we had to work really hard at. Once we had the first nationally ranked kid, we could get two nationally ranked kids. And once we started winning, I could point to something. Um, I'll, I'll give you something I learned. Um, something I learned, I, I was a teacher at a school for kids who couldn't go to regular school before I was a coach. Um, and th these were the toughest kids in the whole district. Like the school couldn't even handle it. And there was this teacher uh well actually the director of the program not a teacher um he had this this system it's just behavior management that was insane it was really good. i use it it's the best thing i learned in coaching this is the best advice i can give you especially if you have a, a program that you're trying to build a uh, couple things go to the good model so so a lot of times what we do is, is if something's wrong in a pro something's going wrong in an organization we go to the negatives we say we got to fix thing. We got to fix this thing. Um, when you really have to highlight the positives, and I think that's a really, really, really important thing. Um, and so, so what we would do is we'd find anything to keep the team motivated too. This is like getting the motivation of the team. But this was, what, what was also what we point recruits to. We still do this, and it's sort of like we started at this point, and then once we started winning, we'd say, "Hey, look where we were this first year. You know, we couldn't even win a match in a dual meet." Look how many matches we won in these dual meets. We didn't win a dual meet, but we won like 10 times individual matches. And then the next year, you know, we started winning matches. We won matches in the Ivy League. And so whatever positive things we could find, we pointed to, to show that we were having a positive trajectory. And that's really led, you know, from a, a team that was 0-37 the first two years you know, we've paid, placed 13th and 15th in the last two NCAA, and we've had a national champion. And to be honest with you, if I look back 17 years and after that first season, if you said those things were going to happen, 
delusionally, I was thinking like, I'd be like, we can do it. But then too, I have to think logically too. The logic side of me is saying like, you might be crazy, <laughs> like, but that's how we did it. So it was always pointing to the, to the good model within the program. It was always pointing recruits to, to make the connection of like where we were heading. Um, and, and it was super intentional and it was super laid out too. I mean, we were, we were very organized. We, and also we said it a lot, whatever positive things we had, I knew to repeat it because, you know, after I talked to a kid, some other kid, some other coach was going to talk to that kid. So the next week it had to be repeated. Even with our presentations, they're just the same information bottled up in a different way for a different time in the recruits process. The things we hammer home are always, the, always really the same things. Um, and then finally, this thing I learned uh, from that school, um, and it's a quote, and it's our family's quote, and I live by this. And and it wouldn't, I would, we would never be where we are right now, personally, as a as a family and and, and as a program. It's just gentle pressure, relentlessly applied. I think we want to be in the society. We want instant gratification, um, but it was just always just dripping away. The one recruit, you know, the one the one kid that said I'm even interested, but didn't come. Hey, we're getting closer to getting what we want. And so personally, for my own, you know, uh, self-survival, I guess you could say, I was looking for the positive things too, instead of focusing on how bad everything was. That was really long. I apologize, Julie. <laughs> but uh, That's good. but uh, so yeah, those are, those are the things that I think really carried us in those early days, especially. Yeah, all good stuff. Um, and I think, again, super relevant for where a lot of our coaches are at right now. Um, who've just been handed a new program or taking the reins of something and they're like, where do I even start? And I think I would just reiterate the importance of, of being organized, like you mentioned. I've, I've sat through this recruiting presentation several times now. Um, I remember seeing it for the first time and being so impressed by it, you know, to reiterate how organized it was, how thought out it was, and, and the things that it pointed to. And as a student athlete, as a 17 year old kid, you can't help but look at the slide deck and be like, dang, they got it all going on here. Um, you know, and I want to just add one thing really quick. If yeah, there's a lot of new coaches and just, I messed this up, up really bad. And it, it's like, I could have probably, I could have probably, the team probably could have been better sooner. Um, you got to lean into the department. Like if, like, I wish I, I didn't want to show that I, I didn't know anything. Cause I didn't know anything when I first started to be perfectly honest as a head coach, I was in a new school. I didn't know anything about it, but I like had to pretend like I was confident and I, and I knew what I was doing. I wish I would have went to the best coaches and I would have, I wish I would have went to their, asked them to go to their recruit presentations or any sort of like, you know, why is this guy winning? Like, how is he getting recruited or girl or woman? And so, so I think like that was a huge mistake. If I were to ever, I don't think I'll ever leave Princeton, but if I were to leave, that would be my first order of business is I would go, to the top five coaches in the department, and I'd request an hour meeting with them. And then I'd like to go from there. I'd like to say to them, like, can I go to your recruiting presentation if you have recruits and, and just be a fly on the wall. I'll just sit in the back. Um, and so that's one thing I, I wish I had done. And I think I could have, I, I could have done a lot better sooner. Awesome. Good stuff. So we'll move on here a little bit. Um, so all that being said, like, what do you think are some of the contributing factors that you and your staff focus on in order to ensure your athletes are staying at Princeton for four years? You've already gotten them to come there. They go through the recruiting process. They sign their, their letter of intent. Um, or in the case of the athlete, you don't have a letter of intent. But for most of these schools, a letter of intent, they're on campus. Um, and for every reason, they're not happy, um, whether it's academically, athletically, socially, whatever it may be. Um, and in a climate where the transfer portal is going crazy, I mean, we see most of it in the media at the division one level, but it's happening in, in the women's wrestling circuit right now as well. Um, so with all that happening, how do you create a positive experience for these athletes? One that makes them want to stay at Princeton for the duration of their career, um, even if everything isn't going as smoothly or as perfect as maybe they had hoped. Yeah. So again, um, I'll start with Princeton. It's hard to leave Princeton just because it's it is such a good school and to, to get into Princeton's like it's like a lot of kids dream so even if it's not going great they generally want to stay but what I will say is like they can leave the program there's no I have no I, I have no guys tied to a scholarship it's all financial aid uh there's if if they get in you know and they decide they're not going to they don't have to wrestle one second for us 
and every state the same in their life in terms of academics and money, financial aid. So there, there's 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 no specific tie to our program. But what I'll say is many kids don't leave and, and we don't kick off many teams. I think in this current group of like, if we look at this four year period of kids that have come in, I think we've had one kid quit and I've had to, uh, you know, dismiss one kid. Uh, that's pretty good. <laughs> and no one's transferred. The other thing is we've never taken a transfer. Um, so I think that's, that's the, I'm looking right now at programs that are taking in a lot of transfers. And then naturally I wonder what that says to the kids that are already there culturally wise. Um, so is it going to become a revolving door? And I, and I think coaches are having issues navigating this. They want the next best guy, but they told this kid that that's in the program, you know, you're our guy. And now all of a sudden they, the guy's not the guy. So, so I think taking in the transfers also leads to issues, but I'd say one thing for, uh, and I have all these little catchphrases as you'll see, but they help guide me. Um, and we're in a, we're in a really in-depth process right now, like meeting with the athletes end of the year, having these sort of exit interviews. Um, we talk about partnerships, not dictatorships. So, so when, when it, I'm not, I'm not a yell at you, you have to do this type of coach. It's not in my nature. Um, I think as a coach, you have to sort of figure out what your positive personality traits are. And you've got to try to lean into that um, and, and use that, not try to be someone you're not. I'm not a, like, I'm an introvert, really, to be honest with you. I'm an extrovert because I have to be. Um, but I'm not someone that's going to yell and, and be like, you have to do this. And Julia can tell you, and you have to do that in the office. It's more like, okay, what's your strength? Okay, where can we get you? In addition to our athletes, they know um, I want I want feedback. I want them to be brutally honest. We tell them uh, we're going to be brutally honest with you. But I think that keeping the kids on the team, it's got to be bigger than, again, it's got to be bigger than the winning and losing. They got it. There's 30 guys on our team. 10 are going to start. Um, so 20 guys who are good in high school, they're all around state champions or something like that, or, you know, pretty damn good. Um, and they, they had dreams of being the national champ and they're not starting. So why do they stay? And I think a couple of things is that, you know, they feel they have a stake in the program because they're a partner of the program. They're not just a, a tool for us to win matches. They're, they're, they're a group. Um, I'll say too, like what, what we went through in the beginning, not winning, um, that sort of created an environment where it had to be more than the wrestling. You had to want something to get something more out of the experience than the wrestling. And so, you know, there were things in place even before I got there, this thing called PFW, Princeton Family Wrestling, the guys do it, they chant it all the time, um, where, you know, they have this tattoo. I mean, almost, you know, a lot of the alumni have it where it's PFW, but they do feel like and it's so cliche now because I hate even saying it, this family idea, but but it is, it's true. It's it's like the kids go away from, from their family and their friends. And a lot of them come from, you know, far away, different parts of the country. And they have to feel connected to this group that is wrestling. And often at a place like Princeton, uh, where it can be quite intimidating uh, when we have these first generation, a lot of first generation kids, their parents didn't go to college, it could be intimidating. The wrestling community feels safe to them. So, so it's a really cool thing, I think, in relation to um, making them feel part of something. But I think that's the key is, again, it has to be bigger than just the winning and losing as a coach. Um, you've got to create an environment that's about building those character traits that make you great at everything while also building community. I'd say one thing that's happened, you know, it's taken me a long time to figure these things out, but we pull a lot of outside people into our team. Um, we call it the team around the team. So for example, we, we run the youth program in town and I didn't realize what would happen because of this, because we ran the youth program in town for, it actually was started before I got here and we just continued to do it. You know, we've had 20 plus years of kids wrestle in town, in our room, who had parents who were of the kids 
and had grandparents of the kids. And so they've become fans. And so, and so that's just one example. Like they come to matches now. Um, a lot of them are adults, the kids that wrestled and, and the parents and whatnot. So it's a big deal in town wrestling. But that makes guys feel good too, because they'll come in, you know, they'll be leaving practice and all these little kids and these little kids think these guys are their heroes, you know? So they sort of cross paths where we have a connection that's bigger than just the wrestling. Same goes for our administration. I mean, um, we really try to pull our administration in to be a part of it. If, if we win, um, um, I often, you know, send messages to the administrators saying that, hey, it's their win too. We couldn't do it without you. Um, so I think there's a community piece where our guys feel connected to something bigger than the wrestling. Um, and I think that's very important. I think those are kind of the biggest factors to sort of making a, a kid feel connected. Um, also, you're, you know, as a coach, you're the, the adult figure they see the most. Um, and so they have to feel comfortable when they have issues to come in and say, I have issues. I get upset when a kid has issues that I don't, I didn't hear about. And sort of like, I have to go in reverse and say, you know, what happened here? Why, why, why did these issues that I didn't know about the kid didn't come to me? That makes me feel like I did something wrong um, in terms of the kid didn't feel comfortable enough to come in. So, um, and, and so those are kind of the things just creating, again, it goes back to environment. What environment are you creating? Do people want to stay in that environment? Do people want to come in that environment? Can people be successful in that environment? Cool. Um, so with all that, you talked about, you know, the environment and pulling the administration. And you're at a school that's obviously incredibly academically rigorous, being at an Ivy League institution. So what are some of the ways that you support your athletes academically, um, especially, you know, how hard it is to balance being a student athlete anyway, um, a sport like wrestling where there's extra time put in, you know, kids cutting weight, things like that. Um, what are you doing to kind of keep tabs on your kids um, and make sure that they're doing the work? And then how are you making sure they succeed and, and can maintain the, the academic rigors of a school like Princeton, which I'm sure would apply to any of our schools um, that currently sponsor women's wrestling? Yeah. So, uh, again, a little bit of this, the university is very good at this. So we have a system where um, if a kid did do well on a test, I hear about it. So it's 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 complicated, but it's a very good system. Um, and. And once I hear about it, then the communication starts in relation to, you know, and, and they know that we know academics are important. Um, and so it's sort of like we're an extension of the academic piece of the university. We're not just athletics. We're, we're student athletes. We're coach athletes, you know, like coach, coach uh, academics or whatever you want to say. So, so we are super um super focused on making sure they're doing okay. So the first thing is if we hear about it, we pull them in. It's a pretty good system. The things that I'll say though, that are really, really important on the front end. So freshmen, freshmen, when freshmen come, I kind of joke, I'm like, we're on red alert with the freshmen when they come in the first couple months. By the time the kids are sophomores here, they kind of sort of, so most of them have it figured out. If they haven't had it figured out, They've been kind of screwing around a little too much. And we got we to treat some of those guys like freshmen. But when the freshmen come in, there's a few things that happen that are, are really, really important. The first thing is we have an academic roundtable. So the academic roundtable turns out to be the best thing that happens for these freshmen when they come in. It usually happens in the first two to three weeks. Um, it's led by someone in athletics who's connected to the academic piece. It's a dean. Uh, but he's our conduit uh, between athletics and ac academics. He sort of leads it. But what happens is the older guys basically tell the freshmen, you know, here's what you need to do. It's sort of like the, the overarching question is like, what would you have done differently? <laughs> or what, what would you do now if you knew what you knew, uh, what you know now if you were a freshman, you know? So that's the most powerful meeting we have. Um, and, and because it's rigorous here, uh, those upperclassmen are, are, are incredibly, incredibly helpful to make sure the freshmen get up to speed. Um, and so what happens after that academic roundtable is that the freshmen aren't afraid to ask questions. What I think happens mostly from my experience and my own personal experience going to college, I struggled. Um, I didn't wanna look stupid. I didn't wanna ask a dumb question. Um, and so when you have this 
thing. It's sort of like, there's no longer any dumb questions. We're all here to help you. So that's the number one most important thing that happens when the freshmen come here. Um, beyond that, we've had some mentorship uh, where we'll, we'll have, uh, we gotta be a little more consistent. I just thought of this and I was like, man, did we do this this past year? I don't think we did. But in the past we've done it where a junior will mentor a freshman uh, just so there's someone that they know they have context, uh, I mean, contact with um, in terms of asking those questions and sort of uh, getting them on the right track. Might be the same major or same interest, um, but those things are good too. For us as coaches, again, it's sort of that environment that we create where academics is piece is a piece of the overarching wrestling uh, program. So it's never not really, uh, uh, it's not divided. And we, we ask, I mean, a lot of, you know, we'll probably talk into the mental health thing, I think, later, but, um, you know, we talk, we ask a lot of questions. I mean, a kid comes in and, and he looks like just shot. I mean, I'll grab him and pull him in the office, say, what's going on? He says, I, uh, I'm behind. I'll say, just get out of here. I was like, you need to go, go take care of work. Oh, the other thing that's pretty important too, is I, I really, um, I try not to waste their time. Uh, I try to be as efficient as possible. You, the great thing about wrestling, as opposed to like, say, football, is it really doesn't take much time. If I can't get what I want done in an hour and a half, I mean, maybe a little bit more, like I'm just not a very good coach, like for a practice, I'm saying we do the doubles too, but those mornings, that morning stuff is very efficient as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, we try to, I really think like if I'm going to have a meeting, it better be an important meeting. If I'm going to pull these guys from something uh, where they could be doing their academics. So we think hard about what we're offering these guys and what we're making them go to. Coach Harris, you touched on mental health there briefly. Uh, athlete health has been, or mental health has been a hot topic of discussion uh, in the past couple of years. Uh, a student athlete managing their mental health is an important factor in both their academic and their athletic success. And as it pertains to our topic, ensuring they graduate from Princeton or whatever institution uh, our coaches are here from. So are you prioritizing mental health? And if so, what are some of the things that you're currently doing to make sure you're checking up on your athletes throughout the year? Yeah, it's the number one thing, mental health. If they're you know, if they're, if they've boiled over or it's too stressful, they're not going to perform well in school. They're not going to perform well in athletics. So we are always, I mean, always doing this. And I'll just tell you the one, Julia knows what we do here. Um, the number one tool I use is that we have a questionnaire we send out pretty much every day. Um, and it's a, it's, it takes, it takes the athlete. It might take them 15 seconds to fill out. But one of the questions is, what's your mental state? And they, they click from one, one to 10 being, you know, I'm ready to run through a wall coach to like one. I just, I don't know if I can do this anymore. And so what happens is, and, and funny, there's some other stuff about their soreness and if they drank enough water and how much sleep they got. Um, and, uh, and what I do is, is, is I'll look at the kid's stuff. And if the numbers are low, if it's low one day, I kind of keep an eye on the kid. I'll just see him walk in the room, see how he's doing. If it comes multiple days where they're, cause a lot of times they will be a, you know, they might be a three on day and then Tuesday they're back to an eight. Um, but if they're a three and then they're a three on Tuesday and then they're a three on Wednesday, now I'm starting to get a little concern. And so I'll pull them in the office and that usually leads to a conversation, which is usually usually very helpful uh, with, with, I think, I don't know if it's a difference between uh, athletes and female athletes, but with my guys, they don't want to talk about stuff, especially if they, they perceived as weak. Um, and so, and, and that's just a wrestling thing too. So that's the greatest tool that we have. Um, a lot of times, yeah, I mean, I'll make kids take a week off from training. Um, if they just seem run down and, they're behind and, and I'll say, Hey, you know, this, if you're, you're feeling this way, but I'll check in with them. They just don't, don't come to practice. So that's been the number one tool. The funny thing about that tool is I did a lot of research on this. We tried heart rate monitor, just it's, it's about recovery a little bit. And, but it's kind of morphed more into like the mental state is probably more important than the recovery. And they all go hand in hand. I mean, we've done a lot of things. We we've done heart rate monitors 
I mean, Matthew Kalik had a whoop thing. I He'd put it on his ankle during matches, you know, and we tracked that. And, and so what I learned was like, and, and I read about this too, is that a questionnaire is almost as effective as those biological metrics, just a daily, just a daily questionnaire. Um, so that kind of led, and I think it helps more because it gives you the mental health piece and it's easy for them. And, and, and I'll say this too, like, it, it sounds hard, like every day we're uh, like, we miss days. The kids don't fill it out every day. And then we get back to it. And, and so it's just, it's not, I think a lot of times um, we try to be perfect. And then if we're not perfect, we bail on it. And I was this way a lot. Um, but don't let, uh, don't let, uh, perfect get in the way of good. Uh, I think a long, a long enough timeline, Julia knows, cause she sends the question, but all, a long enough, long enough timeline. If you're consistent enough, you do get really good data back. Um, so I would say that was the number one tool. And then again, just making the environment. So it's fun. Um, we have this and it gets to the point of like, uh, partnerships, not dictatorships. So we have this like super comprehensive end of the year evaluation. It's just through Google Sheets. And we tell the kids like, be, be brutally honest. And, and, and we get a lot of, a lot of amazing feedback through that. And one of the kids said, which was great. I think kind of defined our year a little bit and it hit me like um, he said this year, cause we didn't have a great dual meet year. And he said, this year was, it was interesting. He's an older kid. And he said, this year was interesting in that I felt like we were focused on losing a lot more in than past years and we sort of forgot about the love what what's the why do we love what we're doing and i thought that was pretty impactful where where for me personally i knew you know maybe the environment i created or we created or it, it sort of everyone created wasn't the best environment for them to be successful and feel a part of something bigger than the winning and losing so next year i know i'm going to make an adjustment and focus on the love a little bit. So anyway, again, long-winded answer, but I think the mental health thing is the number one thing that relates to good performance. Awesome. And that kind of actually segues into the last question that we have scheduled here. Um, again, if you have any questions for Coach Ayers, feel free to drop them into that Q&A box and, and we'll do an open Q&A at the end. But uh, we have one more that, that I have planned and what you were just talking about, I think kind of segue into this perfectly. Um, but, you know, we're starting to see an issue with burnout and high athletes high level athletes at the collegiate level, kids that excelled in high school and then get to college and they kind of lose their love for wrestling. Um, wrestling is grueling on its own. And then you throw academics into the mix and it's even more difficult. So how do you work with your student athletes to either prevent burnout or manage it once it's already kind of starting to manifest and, and encourage them to stick with four years of college wrestling? How do you maintain that love and that relationship with wrestling for these guys that have been doing it forever um, and, and kind of feel like they don't have that love anymore. Can you restore it? Um, and, and what are some of the things that you do when you think it worked for you? Yeah, I think, I think you can. And I think you have to, that comes from a lot of conversations. Again, I go back to environment. If you, again, most of these kids, there's 30 kids on the team at least. And, and most of them were the best kid on their high school team. And now one of those kids is, is, is not the best kid on this team. You know, they're, they're, toward, they're number 30. And so how does that guy stay engaged? It comes down to the fact of, again, environment. It's like, a, like what I just said, like this year, maybe for that 30 guy, um, because we were so caught up in the winning and losing, uh, you know, maybe he, he fell off a little bit. But I think it's good enough in our environment where you still feel a part of this thing that we're trying to do. A um, couple of things, I mean, I think we do every year, and I think probably all coaches do this. We set some goals at the at the beginning of the year. Um, and we're we're quick to recognize that in order to reach that team goal or for, to get one guy to win a national title, it's going to take 30. So we talk about that a lot. And and uh, through these meetings that we've been having into the year through through this questionnaire, and then we have the meetings to talk about it. We've always had this issue, and, and maybe the other coaches can relate to this, is about, you know, about a third of, let's say we have 30 guys, about a little more than a third of the team are super focused. They're trying to win national titles, be all Americans, a little bit more than that. The next third are sort of there. They're, they could do it, and they're working hard, but, you know, they're just a little, a tear down maybe talent-wise than those guys, but they are working hard. Then we have this third um, that are sort of, a little bit checked out. And so we 
as a staff talk a lot about how to keep those guys engaged. I think one way is, is to keep them competing, um, to get them to open tournaments. I mean, I've done some crazy stuff where I've driven, you know, two athletes, quite frankly, who I knew would win a match to Ohio, uh, which is about seven hours for, for freestyle nationals. And I knew they were going to go too, but I did it to, for, to be an example for the rest of the team. Like I'll do anything for anybody, even if you're the number 35. And so I think keeping those guys in your mind is really important and figuring out how to have them be engaged with the process of the program being the best it can be. Um, and we lose sight of it during the season and we always catch ourselves where it's like, every weekend we have a match and it's sort of like we're getting ready for that match. So that third of guys that are sort of not going to be the starters, you know, it's easy to forget. So we have to check ourselves and be like, Hey, we got to get these guys engaged somehow. Um, and so it's always, it's always a challenge. That's our, that I would say that's our number one biggest challenge is catering to that third of the guys that, that maybe won't ever start, but also knowing their importance. Um, they're so important in so many ways as workout partners. Uh, that's the easy one that everyone thinks about. But as personalities, a lot of those guys, I'm just telling you right now, from my experience at Lehigh and at Princeton, they get more out of it um, personally than the best guys. The best guys who are trying to get a national title, they're single-minded on winning national titles. They don't know all the good stuff that happens on the periphery. Those guys who are doing it for other reasons, they take different lessons from it and guaranteed 100% those third guys that stick it out in four years and maybe don't wrestle much. They're our best donors, 100%. So if you focus on them, they can get something out of it uh, beyond the national champ guy who's just trying to get that national title. So it's important to keep them engaged. We think about it a lot. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so we'll move on to some of our Q and a questions. We have a couple of them already queued up here. Um, first one, uh, what questions do you include on the daily questionnaire and what questions are you putting on your end of the year evaluation survey? Okay. So good question. I'll just pull it up and let you know. Uh, <laughs> how about that? Let me see if I could find it real quick. Um, hold on one sec. Oh, I can't get this up. Can't get it up on here. So basically, um, the questions are, uh, what, how much sleep did you get? And that's just a number of hours. Um, how sore, these are the big ones. How sore are you? So that's a rate of one to 10. That's the, and then what's your, what's your mental well being? That's a one through 10, 10 being the highest. So, and then there's, you know, what's your hydration? There's like a, we have like every time they open it, there's like, what, what does your pee look like? And then you pick a, pick a number. I'm very, and then we ask how much they drank. Um, that's it. I hardly look at anything, to be honest with you. I look at mental health, one, and then I look at soreness, two. My job, uh, and I learned this from much because I was this way, I overtrained all through high school 100%. There's no question about it. And then I had my coach in, at Lehigh was the Olympic coach. Um, he understood recovery. I didn't know anything about recovery. I thought you just went harder when you hurt. And he, he had, he would kick me out of the room because I was working out too much. So, so for me, I think of recovery more than I think about pushing the guys. For me, it's like, I create this base of like, here's our training plan. What do I need to pull back? So that's the questions on there. The number, it doesn't, honestly, you need, you need the answers to two things. What's your mental state? What's your source? Those are the two things that I look at the most. Sleep's probably three. Um, you could see a pattern there, maybe of soreness and and um, and soreness and uh, the other one I just said uh, and mental health. If they're low, then you're looking at sleep. So that's an easy fix. Um, the questions for the uh, for the end of the year, they're super robust. There's a lot of them. So there, there'll be a um, there'll be a number rating one through ten. So it'll be like rate the preseason, and we have a specific preseason routine that I remind them what it is. That's a one through 10. And then I'll say, what would you like to see done better? Then I have, what's the, rate the practice plan and the practices. What would you like to see done better? We have a strength and conditioning coach, rate the strength and conditioning program. You know, what would you like to see better? 
Uh, we do yoga, rate the yoga. The number one thing I'm looking for though is rate the culture of the team and then provide comments on the culture of the team. That's the one in the meetings afterwards, we spend the most time there, absolutely. Uh, I, we, have, we have 30 to 45 minutes, I would say three quarters of the time is talking about culture. Um, and then we ask them what their goals are, um, what, do they, what do they need to do this summer to ensure that they're working towards those goals. So then our guys do a lot of different things, maybe meant a lot of you won't have to worry about this. The other things, what your summer plans, where are you gonna be? Um, so the culture and what I do too, when I meet with, so I, so they fill out the form for the number piece, I average it. So let's say, you know, I know in my head right now, they rated our practice plan and our practice is a 7.7. .7. So what happens in the meeting, I'll say, oh, hey, you rated this a four. The rest of the team averages 7.7. .7. And, and so that kind of tells them they're off a little bit. And then what I look for in the meetings and, and through the questionnaire are commonalities. Uh, a lot of kids will come up with a specific thing to them. And then I'll just say, hey, you got to work on it individually. But we'll get like themes throughout where I'll pull probably, we'll probably pull about six things out of, the, out of those that we can work on in the next training plan or culturally or anything like that. So those are the basic questions. Um, if you reach out to me, I'll send, I'll send you the questionnaire. I don't mind. Cool. Uh, so moving on to our next question. Um, what other meetings or training or trainings do you feel like have to happen before, during, and after season and why? Um, you have to have an organizational meeting to get on the same page. Uh, uh, I think everyone probably does this. Um, we get in, uh, I ask them what they want to be for what they want for goals. Um, and and what they think the goals of the team should be. And it's a pretty long meeting, actually. We do a couple things that are maybe unique. Uh, we have a theme every year. So that's kind of a big deal, the unveiling of the season theme. Then our poster goes with the season theme. And a lot of things throughout the season are related to that season theme. Um, so we'll we'll meet about that, too. There'll be a vote, and some guys will give their input on what they think should be. It's pretty fun, actually. Like, you know, it's, it was highly it's, it's entertaining. A good, it's, good, it's a pretty, you get some interesting uh you get some interesting input from the team about what they think the theme should be. Uh, to be honest, this was one area we were weak this year. I think for me personally, I know my weakness is communication a little bit. And so I have to work at that. Again, I think I said this earlier, I'm kind of an introvert. I got to work better at being an extrovert. Um, even in these meetings now, a lot of the kids are saying, I wish we had more of these individuals. And so for me, I think that meeting with kids individually throughout the season is, is incredibly important. Um, it just takes a lot of time, to be honest. Um, so that first team meeting, uh, we've done a lot of different things. So we have this higher standard manual. Um, we have meetings based on the intangibles, we call them. So they're the character traits that make you great, discipline, perseverance, um, attitude, um, and then there's those are the primary drivers. And then we have some other one that we get into, a like gratitude. Um, so, so we try to meet on that to have that educational piece. My problem is I don't like taking up a lot of their time because these guys, I'm telling you, it's a tough environment here in terms of the academic piece too. So I, I really think hard about like, hey, is this really, it has to be really important for me to pull them in. Um, and so a lot of our stuff is individual. We do a lot of individual technique sessions and then we'll do also um, video and stuff like that. But I do think that the mandatory meeting at the beginning of the year to get things started is huge. I think the end of the year debrief is, is, is honestly, that's the most beneficial thing for me in moving forward. So those two are necessary. And I think throughout the year, you've got to kind of figure out what suits you and what the team needs. It's sort of a little bit of a feel thing. <laughs> you know, if things went off course, you might have a meeting <laughs> to get things, try to get things back on course, which we did this year. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I think it's dependent on what's going on in the season. Um, what are some of the best resources or books that you think coaches should be reading um, either for yourself or for your team members? Yeah, so I read a lot, but it's funny. I don't have a... a I don't have memory about like what I read. Um, and so there's not like any, any one thing that right now I'm like into sports psychology. 
uh, just because I think I, if I could learn a little bit more about that, then I can help my guys learn that. I'm reading Mind of the Champion right now. Uh, there's this old book that I used when I was when I was wrestling. I, I can't remember. It's like just basic sports psychology. It talks a lot about relaxation and breathing. Um, oh man, one that was great, great that led to our higher standard manual. Uh, it was the Ohio State coach. Um, basically, he did the man the winner's manual. Yeah, that's a good. Oh, a couple ones. I'm thinking of some right now. Um, the winner's manual is really good. Ohio State football. I don't even know his name that's how bad i am at remembering stuff um the winner's manual Ohio state football coach um the all blacks this one is amazing it's the new zealand uh uh rugby team there's a there, I, I i don't know if there's a if you just search all blacks you know book i don't know the exact title of it that's, that's great i'm really bad at this but i stole a lot of things from this um that's really good um I actually really like uh, like stoic philosophy, to be honest. That may sound so corny. Ryan Holiday is really good. Uh, you know, um, yeah, what is it? Uh, I'll think of it. I, I could send something out to you guys, but I do have a, a list of books. I, I use YouTube a lot too. Ryan Holiday's on that too. He's got a lot of stoic stuff. That's pretty good. Stoic philosophy. Um, and so, um, yeah. Uh, oh, uh, the obstacle is the way by Ryan Holiday. It's great for wrestling, really good for wrestling. Um, and so those are a few, uh, I, I could, I could probably, probably should come up with a list, but I do like to read books about this. I just have trouble remembering them all. Cool. Uh, we have one more and then I, I got, uh, wait, we got two more questions. So we're, we're coming up on a yeah. two minute mark, but um, I got time. On, we'll do it. Cool. Um, so one uh, that we just have come in, um, you mentioned that um, Something about what are our direct competitors saying about us during the recruiting process? Mm. How are highlighting the things? How are Trev? Give me more. Something about how are highlighting the things that are perceived as negative? All right, we're gonna come back to that one in a second once Travis rewords that. Um, Maybe you just say something real quick. I kind of know, like, so yeah, I think about what they're saying, and and sometimes we know what they're saying, and a lot of times what they say about us isn't correct. Um, I'm not going to get into specific examples because one Ivy League school was saying something about us that was not true in relation to our academics and what our guys were doing after college. And so I have a whole I have a whole bit on it, but I don't mention that other team either. So I go I really, really focus hard on not mentioning other teams names or mentioning anything about them. We do what we do and that's it. Um, and so I, I don't get into like, sort of like, well, don't go there because of this or that, but that does happen. <laughs> so that I know that some schools have said that about us. And back in the day, it was sort of like, uh, it was easy. It was like, yeah, that's a great school, but they can't wrestle or they're not, they're not having success. So getting back to that, I knew that was being said. So I had to figure out how to counteract it. And that was sort of pointing to those, to those positive things we were doing. And, you know, I had pretty good success at Lehigh uh, as an assistant. We were third. We were fourth in the country. I pointed to those things. I knew what I was doing. I was confident, too. Um, you know, you spin it a little bit. You can be the first. If you're not the best team, like for some of these new teams, I think it's like be a trailblazer. I know that was a big thing for me in those first years. It's like, yeah, you could go to that school and be another guy, you know, and maybe you'll start and maybe you'll do great. Or you can go, come here and, and really make a name for yourself and be a trailblazer. Um, and so uh, you just got to figure out what, what's, what's the best uh, way to go in terms of countering what other schools are saying about you. Sorry, I don't know if that was, that was what was going on. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Cool. Um, and the last one I have here, how long do you give recruits before you need an answer on a scholarship offer, in the case of the Ivy League, um, on a slot offer? Yeah, so... Um, it's weird now. So yeah. used to be, used to be pretty chaotic. You'd start recruiting uh, in, in the July one after their senior, after the junior year. And by, by November one, the recruiting process over. So you go through the summer, you really didn't give any offers till an official visit in the fall official visits happened. Uh, we learned the hard way. We used to give, we used to give 48 hours. Uh, and what we would say is, you know, you have 48 hours. We're not taking the slot away per se. We can give it back to you. 
but we kind of need to, you know, like we need to maintain some control over things, but generally they had it the whole time. The same thing goes for now. I mean, if we offer, they, they pretty much have the slot unless it's getting to the point where there's other kids that are saying, Hey, I want to come. And then there's a discussion about, you know, Hey, you know, we have some other options. Are we really a, a choice for you? So I think it's a tough one. Um, in the Ivies, it's a little different too, because there's no scholarship offer. Um, I think with a scholarship offer, there's a lot more on the line and you sort of have to have some deadlines, especially as it relates to other kids you're recruiting. Um, for us, um, we have to be a little more flexible because we can't just say, hey, you got you have to give us an answer now. Um, it's not like that. Uh, so it's a little bit different. So that's a hard question to answer. Cool. Um, that's all we got for the Q&A questions. I, I have one more question for you. Uh, yeah. How much has Ted Lasso influenced your coaching philosophy? I think I influenced Ted Lasso, <laughs> to be honest with you. I don't know if he's been in our program. Or something. No, but I, I, it's all, so today is Wednesday. I just said to my wife too, she's probably on here. I don't know. Yes. Uh, I said, Oh, it's, it's Ted Lasso tonight. So our whole family watches it. I just think he's, he, he, you can learn a lot from that. I, I think the positive, like the coach has always been portrayed as this guy who's like a dictator and he's yelling at guys and, you know, you know, pushing them around and, 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 and Ted Lasso is the complete opposite. And I love that. It's like, it shows, he shows a lot of compassion. Um, and I think he's thinking about the mental health. So I think that's sort of the new model of a good coach, honestly, like he's good. I mean, I, I watch it. I'm like, this is some good stuff. I mean, I can relate to this. So yeah, I, I, I like Ted Lasso. He's pretty good. I don't know if I've used any of his stuff yet, but I think, you know, he might've stole some of my stuff. <laughs> so now we have much, much, uh, must read, resources now we have must watch resources um <laughs> yeah that's awesome good stuff um well i think that's you know we already went a couple minutes over and that's all the q a questions we have any other closing statements or words of wisdom that you might have for some of the coaches that are on right now i just think you guys being on here um is just it's just powerful you're trying to be good um you know there's 15 people or 17 or something like that i don't know um and you guys got something out of this and and I wish it was more interactive because usually like during like when I'm in, in person with groups of people, I, I tend to learn a lot um, and I'm, I'm tending to try to adjust how I coach it. Cause I think like coaching is a forever process. You never really arrive um, and you're, you're always trying to get better. So it's great to see some people on here and also just reach out to me. I mean, I'll probably ask you questions too. I try to learn something from you, but if you have any questions, definitely reach out. I love coaching and I love teaching. So yeah, thanks for getting on. Awesome. Coach Ayers, thank you guys so much. Uh, we'll be having our next Living Legends series in, what's it right now? May, June. So it'll be in July. Um, stay tuned for that. We'll be announcing another great Living Legend um, and look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you so much. Yeah.